Well, I want to welcome you back to this journey that we're on together through this book called It's Worth It, and then we've got so many meeting in small groups and uh, the weekend services. It's just been an exciting time together as we talk about what's really valuable in life. And Jesus gave us a passage in Matthew chapter 13. We see these several, several different parables where it talks about what really is valuable in life and how it can so easily elude us of what's really most valuable. And so we've been digging the metaphor, the parable Jesus gave is this field that has treasure in it. And so we've been digging in the field because so many of us pass over and just see dirt and we don't see the value of the treasure in the field. And uh, some of the areas that we're hitting are again some places that are a little counterintuitive, and I believe this week is very counterintuitive to modern culture, and uh, I hope that you'll see the treasure in the field. Uh, By the way, we're getting sold all the time on what we should really give our lives to. Uh, There's so many ads and so many different commercials, and I even see people standing on the side of the road right now because it's getting close to tax season. They're dressed up like the Statue of Liberty. Come on, somebody. I mean, it's like people will dress up, come in my store, buy my things, all right? Uh, and, and what many times in life, we're, we're buying all of that, and we're missing what the real treasure is that, that Jesus is talking about. And so we're going to talk about spiritual family this weekend, uh, so many components that make up a great spiritual family, uh, so many different areas uh, uh, we have in, in, in the life of the church. You know, you've, you've got so many things that make it happen, real heroes like dream team members who serve in kids' ministry and park cars and take care of people, uh, real heroes like small group leaders here. I just want to say thank you to all of you that are leading small groups because you're carrying this love, you're carrying this value that I'm talking about to people and allowing them to taste it and really experience it because of your service. Uh, Even things like our worship team. How many of you guys love our worship team? Aren't they awesome? Man, I tell you. They have a CD, by the way, that's out with this project. I'm so excited about being able to listen to them in my car, and uh, they, they're just so great at what they do. I've, I've had just about every job in 20 years in ministry. I've, I've done everything from uh, church janitor to uh, handle and help with uh, strategic planning to preaching to whatever, and, uh, but I did have one area where I was real deficient in the, the first church that I came on staff at. Uh, When I came on, they wanted me to be the youth pastor. I quickly became, at 20 years old, the pastor because the pastor went to get a master's degree in history, and they had no other options. Are y'all with me? They named me the temporary interim. (laughs) I was real excited until I realized temporary and interim mean the same thing. They're like, brother, do not get settled. This is short term. Are you with me? But before I did all that, when I showed up, they said, we don't have anybody to help with worship. I said, well, as a young man, I was sometimes wrong, but never in doubt. And so I just said, okay, I'll do that. I showed up the first week and realized I'm in deep trouble. I'm out in deep water. I'm drowning. I got up there. I realized I don't even understand music. That's true. I don't. I don't even know how it works. There was a lady playing the piano who crossed the Red Sea with Moses. (laughs) She couldn't hit the notes. I'm up there, and, and and I really, I love to tell this story just takes me back. It's a lot more glamorous in the rearview mirror than it is, right? You know what I'm saying? It was not real pretty that day. There's all these people looking at me, and I realize I don't even know how to do the, the thing. <laughs> Any music people? I realize there's, there's different styles. Some people just go here, here. Some people have a wand. Some people put a little swoop on it like that. I invented my own method. I'm up there in the church I was in, you sang from a hymnal, and so you never sing the third verse. Come on, somebody. It's one, two, never the third. You'll get kicked out of the church immediately. (laughs) So you just have to be able to go one, two, and I developed my own deal. It was kind of like this. (laughs) I couldn't get this one, so I just, one, two. Anyway. Thank God we have great worship people. Are y'all with me, all right, to handle that part of spiritual family, all right? I'm not real qualified to talk about how to do this or anything really about music, but I tell you, one of the areas when I preach 
that I really sense the anointing of God and I sense God's heart is when I talk about today's topic. You know, everyone has, as pastors, you preach on a host of things, but you have things that are part of your life that you really share from a deep passion about. And I got to tell you, this is the topic that really just makes me come alive. I, I look back at my life. How many of you are, are, are old enough to say, I, I look back, I really didn't even know that by valuing that, it would be so impactful today. I really had no idea that holding on to that would mean so much to me today. When I talk about spiritual family today, I'm gonna show you from the word of God, but it's more than just a concept or a theory. It's something I've been living for many, many years. Some of my best friends go to church here. Many of our staff members I've been friends with 15, 20 years, walking out family together. And it's not like there's just a closed seat at the table. God's adding people to this family every single day and watching what God does through this understanding of this value called spiritual family. Now, before you think you understand it, in our modern context, I don't think we have the deep revelation that Scripture gives. A lot of people call it community. A lot of people call it friendliness. When people come into Miles and they say, man, where'd all these friendly people come from? Where'd all these loving people come from? Well, it's deeper than friendliness. It's deeper than community. I mean, we love our community and we serve our community, but we'll, we're mobile and we just kind of, you know, we'll move... Spiritual family in a concept is a set of non-disposable relationships that are lived out in the context of the local church. It's a much deeper concept than community or friendliness or niceness. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to show you some passages that I think really highlight it. One of the anchor ones is Psalm 68.6. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 68.6. I'm going to show you that very briefly, but then turn over to Acts 2.42 and I'm going to get to that one as well in just a minute. I want to talk to you about this. I want us to dig in the field. I want us to really see what God has to say to us around this area of spiritual family. And I'm going to ask you a question at the end. So I want you to really think about it. The most important, again, anchor verse that we've held on to for over 12 years now as we started Milestone has been Psalm 68, 6, where David is talking about how when a group of people, it's a song, and when they embrace God's ways, how much it can impact so many people beyond what you comprehend. He says God sets. Now, I want you to see in both of the passages I'm about to show you that it's much different than the American consumer mindset about the kingdom of God. I want you to see the intentionality of God in these passages. It says, God sets. Most people think, look, I, I join a church or I join a set of relationships or I'll, this set of relationships is as good as this set. I'll just kind of move around to whatever. No, 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 no. You're missing God's desire for you. No, it says God sets the lonely in families and he leads out the prisoners with singing. By the way, loneliness doesn't just mean you don't have any friends. Did you know you can have a whole crowd of people around you and still be lonely? You can still not really belong to something bigger than yourself. You can still not really have a sense of, I'm a valuable piece to what God's doing in the earth to advance the greatest agenda on the planet. That's what all of us are hardwired for. By the way, this family thing is challenging, it's difficult, it hurts, it's painful, it comes with, and real love is. Real love says, I don't really want to get too involved in your, uh, real love says, I'll get involved in your mess. What most people see today is, I don't know if I want to do that, and we don't understand what real love really is. I, I know what you want in life. You want to grow, you want to reach your potential, you want to be everything God's called you to be. Well, one of the ways God gets you and grows you to what he's called you to be and do is he sets you in a spiritual family. He sets you in a place where those things can begin to happen. And so some of our greatest longings, some of our greatest desires, some of the richest things in life, by the way, everyone's looking for fulfillment and richness in life. God knows that. So what does he do? He says, look, I'm going to keep you from just being out here isolated where you can't experience that and I'm going to set you, I'm going to set you in a family. Look at this. It's not just Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. Very powerful. It says, but in fact, God has placed, notice the intentionality. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them. So and the fact is, in our culture today, we don't necessarily, again, just 
join a church. We are joined by God to a set of relationships in his body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Our job in this thing is to sense what he is saying and where he is placing. I want to say also up front, as I get passionate about this message, this is not just for Milestone. I hope wherever you go to church, you feel this way. I hope whatever church you go to, you're not just attending a convention center of religious activity where you come in, you interact with just the content from the platform, and you watch some professional people do Christian stuff. I hope wherever you go, you feel like, man, I am in my place. I am in my place, set by God, and I'm not lonely anymore. I belong. I belong, I'm a part of this. My gifts matter, my life matters. I'm set in this. Because you can get content on the internet, by the way. You can get good content. Problem is, that content in that podcast can't get you to where God's called you to go. And it also isn't only the only, it can't be the sum total of you being placed in what God has for you. So that's the, the concept, if you will, of spiritual family. Let's dig in it a little deeper. By the way, it's the glue. All of our values are valuable. This is a glue here at Milestone. As, you, as I hear people say, man, it's different here. What is it? What's different? Well, again, a lot of times you're eating from the apple pie, but you don't know the recipe. And uh, the, the recipe glue, I guess, if you will, the key ingredient is obviously Jesus. But then it's Jesus in the midst of spiritual family is how those things begin to come together. And so uh, this is really, at the end of the day, we're getting down to some of the core passions and reason I wrote the book. I didn't write the book to go on a book tour. In fact, I've denied that. I don't want to do that. I'm raising the kids and I'm building a church, so I'm not looking for another job. I don't think there's an upgrade from being a local church pastor. Um, I didn't do it necessarily to be an author. I wrote this book over a five-year period, pouring my life into it, because I want family for you. I want family for you. I want not something from you. I want something for you. Let's talk about spiritual family. Why is it so valuable? Number one, what makes spiritual family so valuable? Well, number one, spiritual family is God's pattern. How many of you know that the most important things in Scripture, a lot of people get confused about Scripture, but one thing you'll find about it, when you start reading it, there's some very clear themes that are repeated over and over and over and over. Obviously, the central message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talked about last week in his mission. But the vehicle for that mission to be extended to the earth is this thought that we're talking about this weekend called spiritual family. And so we see a pattern of it. We see it not only as a pattern in Scripture, we see it in a, as a pattern in the nature of God in the life of Jesus. And so when something, again, many times we are, are missing the main things of the Bible and arguing about the minor things. I mean, there's certain elements we may not know exactly till we stand before Jesus, whether you're right or I'm right. But let me tell you, when it comes to the core main messages, they're not obscure. They're not confusing. It's amazing to me in our current generation how we can miss this one because it is so clear in Scripture. It has existed before eternity. I mean, God himself in his nature is three persons yet one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, operating in complete unity within the Godhead. There's this relational dimension. And then God who's totally self-sufficient and could have lived his life completely by himself with all of his sufficiency and completeness decided for you and I to come into the world for relationship and for fellowship. Adam and Eve. Adam, it's not good that he's alone, so he gave him Eve. We see this familial nature all the way through. Even the Old Testament is this desire of God to bring back this family and redeem the hearts of these people so that they can love their God and love one another. Abraham, you'll be the father of many nations. I love all the stories. I love the Davids and the Jonathans. Uh, you better have a Jonathan in your life to encourage you. By the way, we always quit alone. You always quit alone. You quit on your faith. You quit on your passions. You quit on your goals if you're all alone. You better have the people around your life that look you in the eye and say, I'm not going to let you quit. I'm not going to let you quit. I love the Elijah-Elisha story. 
how Elijah the prophet pours into an Elisha and loves him and helps him and encourages him. And by the way, don't hear as you hear me tell these stories that this thing is some kind of top-down deal. These guys were connected by way of revelation, and I love how Elijah received as much encouragement from pouring into Elisha as Elisha received as he got the double portion. Ruth and Naomi, I love the story. They're looking for food. Just like I find a lot of people today, I need that. I wish I had that. And the most miserable person on the planet is the one who gets it, and it can't satisfy. Because it is not what Jesus died for. It is not what's worth it. That it. I love the story of Ruth and Naomi. They're looking for food, and they find family. They're looking for what they think is it, And they find family, and that relationship produces the life of Jesus Christ. The last chapter, last pages of the Old Testament, I'll turn the hearts of the fathers toward their children. I love Jesus' life. Don't you love Jesus' life that he modeled for us to live relationally? I love how he loved those guys. I love how he prayed and those guys became part of his life. I love how he he helped them see things properly. I I love how when Peter wanted to quit, he even told him he would want to deny him. And he did deny him, but Jesus still loved him anyway and went after him and said, you're not going back to fishing. You got to feed my sheep. I love that about Jesus. I love we don't worship a concept or a statue or a theory, but Jesus modeled for us how to live relationally. I love later in the New Testament the stories of people like Paul and Timothy. And when Paul shows up to him and says, come with me, be with me, and they have this familial language among them. Timothy, my son, and he just encouraged him and he wrote letters to him. And this young pastor who would have quit because he had all this pressure, but he had his Paul, his, his, his daddy in the faith, kept writing him letters saying, don't quit. Don't let them look down on you because you're young. This is a pattern throughout all of scripture. I love Acts 2.42. Probably some of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, to be honest. It says they devoted themselves. By the way, there were no seminaries. There were no church growth classes. The reason they were doing this is because they got it from Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe. Everyone was feeling a sense of awe. What's God doing? The many wonders and signs who were performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day, I mean, these guys are intensely relational. They're everyday kind of Christians, not just a Sunday Christian. They're every day encouraging one another along. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Why do we do small groups at Milestone? Why do we encourage relationship? Why do when people come through the parking lot, when they told me when you started this church, Jeff, these are professional people, leave them alone. Let them sit on the back row. Why did I say, I don't want to leave people alone? I want them, again, there's a season. Maybe you're healing and you need need room, but I'm telling you, over time, You will quit anyway if someone doesn't grab you and say, come on, man, let's get over, let me help you, let's be together. Why? Because that's what the early church was doing. This is the Bible, last I checked, the Bible's not subject to our new church growth patterns. We're subject to the Bible. And they were meeting together. They were walking together. I love how it says they were sincere too. Don't you hate professional church? Come on now. You just wish the pastor would say that. There's an excellence. But I love an atmosphere that's sincere. I want to say thank you to the people of Milestone Church. I'm honored to be your pastor because of the way you are sincere. I hear it from every person. When I'm in the community getting coffee, I showed up there. There's a sincerity and there's an authenticity that says, hey, man, what's, don't you just hate like, hello, hello. My pastor told me to stand at the door and be a greeter. I don't even really like people, but I'm doing it. <laughs> you can tell when, you wa- when you're wanted. You can tell when people are exactly excited that you're there. I hate that. <laughs> what about, what's up, man? How you doing? How you, how's life? How are the kids? Anything I can help you with? Any way we can be? Sincerity. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I guess so. 
Because if I didn't know anything about Christianity or the message of Jesus, I think I'd want to be around people like that. I'd want to go into an atmosphere like that. And when people are still getting, again, open to that kind of atmosphere helps them come to a place to decide to follow Jesus. Number two, though, it's not only a pattern, it's a powerful pattern, but number two, it's a revelation. So some of you are like, Jeff, I'm trying to get where you're, okay, how do you get there? Well, it starts with a revelation. Spiritual family is a revelation. What is a revelation? Is it like revelations? Oh, oh man, do, 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 do. No, no, I'm not talking about some weird spooky thing. A revelation is when a concept or a truth from Scripture goes from just being true for everyone else and it becomes so real to you by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it's now real for you. You own it. Pastor Jeff doesn't own it. I don't need any more friends. I got friends running out the ears. I got people I love. I'm connected. I'm in family. I have pastors. I have relationships, and I'm not bragging, but I'm one of the richest people you've ever met when it comes to relationships. I don't, I don't need the revelation. I'm not preaching this for the, I'm saying the revelation has to come to a place where you go, I own that. I own that. I own that revelation of spiritual family. And then you begin to move towards that revelation. It comes with having a revelation of his church. A lot of people today into Jesus and down on church. And most of the people that have that perspective are struggling to grow. They're stalled out in their faith. Because Jesus loves his church, Jesus died for his church, and Jesus uses his church to get you to the place Jesus has called you to be. And so independently and isolated alone, just reading books about Jesus can't put the nature of Jesus in your heart, and you can't model the life of Jesus unless you're plugged into what Jesus loves. And when you get plugged into what Jesus loves by way of revelation, then you start to grow, and you just begin to see all these intangible benefits, by the way, because then he places you, and you start seeing your purpose in his kingdom, and you're not disconnected from the process, and what happens is you begin to grow into all that God has called you to be. I love to make it real for you, so I want to show you each week through this. Um, I've tried to help you see it by way of a video. Let me show you a guy who came to our church, a young guy when he came to our church, still a young guy, but he was real young when he showed up here, very successful business owner uh, now, and just the process of his life of how God uses spiritual family to grow us and to get us into all that he's called us to be. Watch this with me. I mean, I just remember, I remember when I was young, I was always passionate, emotional, loud, opinion. I mean, very, I mean, very type A, which I, I honestly, I just had a lot of, I had like a lot of problems with authority, whether it be teachers or, uh, or pastors or bosses. I was always able to rely on my talents. I played piano, I played drums. It transitioned into being a good sound guy, which transitioned into me being a, a good graphic designer. And I didn't really have to worry about all of these little character flaws in my life because I guess people would just look past them because they needed an ability. I went to college for about three months and dropped out of college to become a designer in an advertising agency and kind of worked my way up there to the creative director. And for a while, it was going really well. I thought I had everything going. I had a great, I had a great wife. I had a, a little baby. But over that period of time, I started to really just kind of disagree with my bosses, um, and and got fired, which was probably the one of the worst moments of my life. And it was in that, in that moment when I realized this isn't the first time you've been fired. It's not the second. It's not the third. For some reason or another, you've figured out how to get fired from every single job you've ever had. And you start to realize it's not them, it's you. Up until that point, no one had ever said, hey, you, your character flaws, like, you need to do something about this. Which is kind of funny because the reason why I came to Milestone in the first place was because they were hiring me to do something, to do a talent, right? Which is my whole life. What I didn't expect 
was the idea that it's great that you're great at some things, but we're way more concerned about your character than we are about what you're able to accomplish for us. And so for me, that's when I, I really truly started to understand spiritual family. And it's not easy. I mean, being, being in a relationship with people, having people tell you that you handled that situation wrong and that you need to go apologize to someone and you need to write this email, like that's not easy. I mean, I've had multiple conversations with my wife where I'm like, I don't need this. Like, let's go somewhere different. It's often in games when things are going well. But as soon as someone crosses your will and says, hey, like there's this thing inside of you that it's not pretty, that's when it hurts. That's when you have to say, like, am I, am I called here or not? And I remember Pastor Jeff saying, like, I'm not concerned about whether or not you can build a great product. I'm not concerned about whether or not you'll build a great company and make a lot of money and probably make a lot of other people money. What I'm concerned about is you, your health. I'm concerned about the health of the people you're leading. And I'm concerned about your wife. And will she still want to be your wife when this is over? And for me, I'm like, maybe not. I mean, I think it's in those moments where you realize, like, spiritual family is not a game. The people that God's placed in my life have radically changed the direction of my life. And if they weren't here, my, like, my business wouldn't be what it is. My family would not, there's no chance my family would be what it is. Looking back on the last four years of my life, the, literally the most impactful thing in my life has been the people that he's placed in my life in spiritual family that are willing to walk along walk through this with me and sometimes you don't truly get to see the blessing that it's had on your life until you look back and for me when I look back at the last three and a half years and see a family three little girls that I, I, I'm just so happy they have this dad and not the dad that I would have been four years ago I legitimately believe that God placed me at Milestone Church I believe that this is the family these are the people that I'm supposed to build with. There's no chance that anything that I touch would be where it is today had it not been for all of those influences in my life. I maybe want to say thank you to Daniel for his transparency. It wasn't just, just my impact with Daniel. So many, that's the, the powerful thing about family is there's multiple anchors and relationships and so many people that speak into uh, a young man's life as he's growing and developing. And I want to give you the final thing because, again, number three, why is it so valuable? Um, it, it is challenging. It does take energy. As we've been talking about in It's Worth It, uh, anything that is valuable needs to be prioritized and will have a cost attached to it, but it's so valuable then it becomes worth it. Number three, though, spiritual family is generational. And this touches on an area that all of us care about, and, and that is those that we're leaving behind, what we're really leaving behind in our life. Um, and so it, it, this is something when you live this way and build this way, it becomes transferable to the people that matter most to you in your life. I want to give you this metaphor before I pray for you. This is what happens when we do Christianity as again, in rows or convention center style, and we just let the pros do the church thing, and we never become part of the family. It's, it's like this. It's the same thing that happens. Again, it's a good picture in the natural family. The Bible says that when you receive Jesus, you're born again, and you're, you're a baby in Christ. In fact, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without being born again. So spiritually, when you're born again, no matter what age, you become a baby, and uh, it's, it's a cool thing to have babies. Every church needs babies, right? The babies are excited. They're so full of anticipation. You know, they're praying for parking spots. They're asking God to bless their finances, and they're finding quarters in their couch. I mean, these guys, don't you just love new Christians? Come on, are y'all with me? I just love new Christians. They're giddy. They're excited. They're full of anticipation, just like all of us in the natural, a little kid on Christmas in their footy pajamas. Come on. And they just can't wait. You were that way. Can't wait to open your Christmas present. That's the way you are when you get born again. That's the way you are about the kingdom and church. 
I can't wait till church comes. I can't wait to read my Bible. I can't wait to serve. I can't wait to give. I can't, we get to do all this? How many of y'all remember when you were like that? You're excited about it. I can't believe it. And, and, and that's the great thing about a child. It's the wild Bible says you have to have childlike faith because you have anticipation. You have giddy excitement about the things of God. Then you become a teenager. Are y'all with me? God loved teenagers. I love my teenagers. The only thing is being a teenager is a challenging transition because you're expected to have adult-like thoughts and responsibilities, but you're in transition. The danger, by the way, those of you raising teenagers, stay close to their heart, connect with them because the transition's tough, but they can get to the other side. By the way, God understands about transition. In fact, the children of Israel, when they were going into the promised land, that he didn't want them to stay in transition, though they wanted to what? Well, we can just go back. He didn't want them there. He just gave them manna. I'll just sustain you because I want you to go fully into the promised land. And here's what happens. The challenging part of that is you want to get back to that giddy anticipation, and the problem is you can't go crawl back in your baby bed and put on your footy pajamas. It's an awkward phase. I believe because of us not prioritizing spiritual family, we have a generation of teenagers who are stuck in transition going, I want that giddy feeling again. But what happens is if you're not pastored through transition in the context of spiritual family, you get critical. You get, oh man, and you get kind of bigger, too big for your britches sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And I know and I think and you don't ever really grow up. Because you know what you're really looking for? It's okay to have anticipation. It just looks different than when you were a little baby in the crib. Here's what the new anticipation is. Come on, grandparents. I got some grandparents that in the house. I mean, come on, parents. You know what the greatest joy is? Not staying a teenager, but growing up and reproducing family in the lives of others and sitting around the Christmas tree, one of those little two-year-olds, and they got their footy pajamas on, but you're not a two-year-old anymore, and you watch them open their presents. Come on, somebody. That's the joy. The highest level is not when you think you know a lot that you haven't matured into. The highest level is, the Bible says, and I'm going to talk about it the last week. You want to know what the highest level life is? It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You want fulfillment in life? You want real joy? You want real satisfaction? You want to return back to the joy of your salvation? Then watch it be reproduced in the lives of someone else around you. Multiplied into the lives of others. You say, Jeff, what does that look like? It looks like not being so stuck on what you know because it's not about what you know. It's about what you're living. When's the last time you gave it away to somebody else? When's the last time you served someone else? When's the last time you said, this ain't about me. I'm going to find somebody to give my life to. I'm going to do the messy, painful stuff. I'm going to trust God. And when you do that, we're not doing it to get from God. Here's what you're going to feel. Giddy excitement. excitement. Oh my gosh, it's Christmas again. And you know what will happen? You can multiply that. You can reproduce that. You can't reproduce cool. You can't reproduce theories. But you can reproduce a life that has the DNA that I'm talking about in the lives of other people. And by the way, you can also reproduce it in your own children. Those of you still raising kids, you say, why don't they have a passion for God? What are you saying is most worth it? Because they're going to follow your pattern. And the thing you want from them in life is for them to catch your anticipation and enthusiasm that you're multiplying into their life. I was talking to a guy this week. Some of you are like, well, Jeff, I don't have kids in that phase. I'm an empty nester. I was talking to a guy that's an empty nester. Y'all want to know some cool thing about, the cool thing about spiritual family? There are no empty nesters in spiritual family. Did you hear what I just said? That's the cool thing about being a grandparent. You can try some new theories that didn't work with your kids. Come on now. <laughs> well, it didn't work with them. I'll see if the grandkids can get it, okay? <laughs> Empty nester, it's not even a concept in spiritual family. Can I tell you how many people are looking 
where they've had broken family and father wounds, the father wound that is plaguing our culture today, some of the greatest societal problems in our culture are the father wounds that people have been plagued with. We have an opportunity. Can I talk to you if you're stuck in teenage and critical and, man, you're not excited? Can I tell you, we need you to grow up. We need you to be a mom and dad to this next generation. We need you to say, you know what? You can make it. And you can't get condemned by wherever you failed or made mistakes. You have to receive the grace of Jesus and say, you know what? I want to offer this to you. And it's going to be a powerful thing if you do. You're going to find yourself like a kid again at Christmas. So excited about all the things that God is doing. I have one application point this week. One application point. We're going to talk about it in our small groups. And it's simply this. It's real simple. Have I committed to spiritual family? Are you attending church? Kind of. Are you sitting in rows? Or have you said, you know what? I'm committed to this pattern of life. And I'll promise you this. It'll be worth it if you do. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I pray, Lord, for every person within the sound of my voice. Lord, first of all, if they don't know you, Jesus, or if they're away from you, I pray they just run right back to you. That's the greatest thing about you, Jesus, is no matter where we are, we can run straight to you and you receive us every time. If you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna ask you just to say, Jesus, I give myself to you. I surrender myself. Maybe you've been away from him and you just need to come back and say, Jesus, here I am. Again, I, I know you're where real life is. I bring myself to you. If you don't know him and never have accepted him, you just simply say, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross. Make it your prayer, rose from the dead, come into my life and save me. If you prayed that prayer, I'm gonna ask you to come forward at the end of the service or let us know because you're a baby and you need a family to help you walk in all that God's called you to be. But Lord, I pray for a second group here, wherever they're at. Lord, if they're in that giddy, childlike phase, Lord, I pray that they wouldn't get stalled out. They'd walk in the fullness of what you've called them to be. I pray if they're in that in-between phase, Lord, today you would inspire them to go forward into all that you have. I pray today, Lord, that you'd speak to us by way of revelation and place us where you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.